Assalamu alaikum. Um, my name is Sara Temur. I'm an infectious disease specialist in New York. I work at the ICANN School of Medicine at Mount Sinai. Thank you for inviting me to talk to you today. Um, this is just a basic overview of COVID-19, of what we know about this new disease so far. Okay, so COVID-19 is the disease that's caused by the novel coronavirus, SARS-CoV-2. Um, so it's important to understand that COVID-19 is the name of the disease and not the virus. The virus is SARS-CoV-2. It belongs to the coronaviridae family, and within that, the genus uh, that this virus belongs to is the beta coronavirus genus. These are single-stranded, enveloped RNA viruses that circulate through mammalian and avian hosts. Um, all right, so here you can see the two genuses, the alpha coronaviruses and the beta coronaviruses. And a lot of these are very common. Uh, they infect people worldwide and we repeatedly get infections because of these types of alpha and the two beta coronaviruses that are highlighted there. Um, and most, and these infections are mild respiratory tract infections, mostly upper respiratory tract infections that uh, people just recover from. It's the common cold that we all get. But then among these, uh, among the better coronaviruses, SARS-CoV-2, which was the cause of the initial SARS outbreak that happened in 2003, then the MERS-CoV, which is the Middle Eastern respiratory virus, and then the SARS-CoV-2, which is what we're dealing with now, are the three beta coronaviruses that can lead to severe lung inflammation and lead to what we call uh, severe adult respiratory syndrome. And SARS-CoV-2 is the seventh coronavirus to cause infection in human beings. So this is um, this diagram here, and I will try to walk you through it. So if you can see the arrow right over here, uh, that's the 2019 novel coronavirus. Uh, this is a phylogenetic analysis of full-length genomes of the beta coronavirus. And basically, you can see that this phylogenetic analysis shows that the novel coronavirus right here uh, falls in the subgenus of beta coronaviruses, Sarbicovirus. And genetically, this virus is identical, is, is, is very much similar to bat cl -CoV. So it's very similar to these two strains here of bat sl uh, -CoV, um, and shows 88% homology almost. So 88% uh, genetic ident um, uh, homology, like or uh, it's 88% genetically identical uh, to these strains that circulate in bats. And, they, and these are SARS-like strains that circulate in, in bats. So they cause um, similar disease, basically. Um, and then you can see here that the, ori the original SAR is right here, SARS-CoV, that's the original SARS, and, and it seems to be genetically very distinct from the original SARS-CoV, um, and it also does not seem to be very similar to the MERS-CoV, which is the Middle Eastern Respiratory Virus. So genetically identical to these two strains of um, uh, the, the uh, SL-CoV in bats, which uh, cause SARS-like illness. This, a little bit about the structure of the virus. So as I said, this is a, um, a single-stranded RNA virus. Um, and you can see here that this is the RNA genome. Uh, it has a number of proteins, um, a few of them I'll mention. So the helical nucleocapsid protein, or what's called the N protein, it is bound to the RNA genome here. It's a helical capsid around the RNA genome. Um, the virus has an envelope. And in the envelope are a number of other proteins. So there's the matrix M glycoprotein right here, which is shown in pink. Then there's the envelope E protein, which is shown here in mauve. And then like studying the entire envelope here is the spike S glycoprotein, which um, is, is, a, is very important in viral replication. And we'll go over that in a, in a little bit. This is the cycle of the virus. So basically the spike protein that I just mentioned, the spike S glycoprotein, it binds to the ACE2 enzyme that is present in the plasma membrane of type two nemocytes uh, in your lung. And um, is, it also binds to intestinal epithelial cells. Uh, there is a um, 
uh, host serine protease enzyme, which is listed right here, the TMPRSS2, which basically uh, cleaves the S protein here, and it allows the virus to, um, it allows the membranes to fuse and essentially allows the virus to enter the whole cell. So here, uh, as you can see, the virus is undergoing endocytosis, and all of these subsequent steps are completed in the cell. Uh, viral replication is done, and new virions are created, which are then released uh, from the cell. The immune response, and we'll go over this in a, in a second, because it's very important to understand, to understand the pathophysiology of COVID-19. It's important to understand what happens to the immune system. But in general, um, like all other viruses, um, basically there's a type one interferon response during initial infection. And if this response is robust, there are, there's a good chance that you will clear the virus. The chances of you clearing the virus are greater. And this is felt to be one of the reasons why children don't seem to be very severely affected by, by this infection is because they have robust interferon responses. Um, so if there is an, if there is a, so, so the initial response would be the type one interferon. And then after that, um, adaptive immune response follows with T cells, um, et cetera. Um, and basically, especially in those patients who develop severe infection, it's felt to be an initial delay or suppression of the interferon, the type one interferon response, which can be seen with, with age, et cetera, for many different reasons that is uh, felt to allow the virus to set up replication and to set up shop, uh, after which there's immune dysregulation in, 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 in cases of severe infection, and we'll go about that in a second. That's what drives the uh, severe adult respiratory uh, syndrome that we see uh, in these patients. Um, so transmission, um, as we know that the initial cases were associated with the uh, wild animal market in, in Wuhan, there were some workers there that got infected, uh, but from then on, a direct link with the market was not found in all of the, um, you know, like the, the great majority of the other cases that were found. So basically, this person-to-person -person transmission with this virus uh, early on in infection in the asymptomatic phase and in the early symptomatic phase, there's very large numbers. Uh, the virus is replicating in very large numbers in your upper tract, and that's what uh, contributes to uh, it being its ability to spread from one person to another. So the main mode of transmission is person to person. Um, so from the time of exposure, the incubation period is felt to be within 14 days for this virus with most people developing symptoms around four to five days. Most series, most of the published data gives you a median time of four to five days for the development of symptoms. And then the symptoms have you know, like a spectrum for, from most people having mild disease, and then, um, uh, you know, a smaller percentage can go on to develop moderate, severe, and then critical illness from it. As far as symptoms are concerned, most people will have a fever. As you can see here, 88% have, um, uh, um, have fever. And then the other common symptom is dry cough and fatigue. This is mostly not a purulent cough. It's mostly a dry cough. And then usually a few days into the illness, it, uh, if, if somebody is developing uh, SARS or more severe disease, they will complain of shortness of, shortness of breath or uh, uh, dyspnea. Um, there are many papers out there and many case series. Um, I chose this one because it has a very large um, uh, number, a very large sample size. So this is data from the uh, Chinese uh, CDC. And they basically looked at over 72,000 cases, as you can see, of which uh, the cases that were confirmed by RT-PCR were, were over 44,000. And majority of the cases in this cohort, 62% were confirmed. Um, so this is just to tell you what the spectrum of disease is. So in this very large cohort of um, you know, patients with the SARS-CoV-2 infection, 81%. Uh, had mild infection, 14% had severe infection, and then 5% had critical infection. So basically consistent with what we've been hearing about, these, about this virus all along, and certainly consistent with clinical experience, is that most people will either develop no symptoms, or if they do develop symptoms, they'll develop mild symptoms and recover from it. Um, and then there are patients who go on to develop more severe illness, and we'll talk about what leads to that. 
So these are the risk factors that one needs to be aware of. Um, these are the established uh, risk factors for uh, severe infection uh, with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. So uh, age is a big risk factor, as is gender. Uh, this disease seems to be affecting males a lot more than females. Um, Pre-existing pulmonary disease, chronic kidney disease, diabetes mellitus, cardiovascular disease, obesity, having a BMI of more than 30, history of hypertension, all of these are established risk factors uh, based on the data so far. And then certainly any type of cancer, uh, iatrogenic immune suppression, say, in, 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 in um, having had a transplant, or the use of any other biologics for autoimmune disease, et cetera. Uh, HIV with low CD4 numbers, all of these are risk factors for severe disease uh, due to the virus. I'd like to take uh, some time to talk about this paper, which I thought was very helpful. It, um, it basically helps to understand the pathophysiology of the severe disease that is seen with this virus. And I think it's essential to understand the pathophysiology before we can understand the basis of a lot of uh, treatments that are being looked at and a lot of treatments that are, that are being used uh, for patients with severe disease. So this paper, the, it's out of China. They looked at over 450 um, uh, patients and basically looked at uh, the blood, uh, blood counts. Uh, they looked at blood cell counts as well as looked at uh, T cell numbers, B cell numbers, et cetera, to see what happens to the immune system in these cases. So before I dive into this, just for the students in the audience, I'd just like to you know, kind of uh, put a little uh, refresher out there um, on T cell development. And I'm sure all of you know this better than I do because you're studying this right now and well, you're smarter than I am. But um, you know, just to go over it very briefly, so this is the thymus and this is the periphery, right? So this is the intrathymic development right here. Um, and basically, you have these immature thymic T cell precursors that are then going on to developing uh, into cytotoxic T cells, which is CD3 plus, CD8 plus, then the helper T cell, which is 3 plus, 4 plus, and then a certain percentage of, of these uh, cells become regulatory T cells or what we call the T regs, right? And then like once the cells are out of the thymus, like further maturation is, is occurring in the periphery, and that is when there are antigen presenting cells, which are uh, presenting numerous antigens to these T cells in association with MHC molecules. And as these T cells undergo activation, they will then go on to develop into a memory, uh, memory T cell pool and a vector T cell pool. Uh, these are the two main types of pools that will develop. So at this point, like you know, once the cell has left the thymus, it's called a naive T cell. And further differentiation will lead to effector T cells um, and will lead to memory T cells. And this here is just to point out, like you probably have come across this. Um, if not, like in your textbooks, you'll certainly come across this in the literature. These are basically the effector T cell subsets. And uh, what distinguishes one type, say Th1 from Th2 versus Th17 is essentially um, you know, this differentiation is made upon or occurs because of the kind of antigen that um, they encounter and the type of cytokine that's generated. And accordingly, these virus, the, all of these different T cell subsets have uh, a role in different types of infections and different types of processes, uh, other processes like allergy, autoimmunity, etc. And the T regs I'd like to mention, the T regulatory cells that I just mentioned here that you know, a certain percentage of cells will go into the regulatory T cell pool. These cells are basically gatekeepers. They're essentially regulators, as their name implies, and they're responsible for maintaining immune homeostasis. All right, uh, so with this in mind, we'll take a look at this paper. So as I said, over 450 patients. You can see here, I've underlined patients with non-severe clinical disease and then with severe COVID-19. Um, and this is just looking at all of their various blood cell counts first. Um, so let's just focus our attention here where I highlighted. And one thing that was seen in all of these patients and um, significantly more so in patients with severe disease than with non-severe disease was that the leukocyte count was higher, the neutrophil count was higher, right? Um, 
lymphopenia, as you may have heard or, or read about so far, is something that has been noticed, noticed like pretty consistently in these, in these patients. The lymphocyte count is lower. And, and, and again, more so in those who have severe disease than those who have non-severe disease. Accordingly, if you look at the uh, neutrophil to lymphocyte ratio for these patients, it's going to be it's going to be elevated and it's going to be more elevated again in those who have severe disease than those who have non-severe disease. All right, so this is just your regular CBC, your complete blood count, right? So this is what that shows. Uh, looking further at um, analysis of the lymphocytes, there are a couple of key things that I'd like to uh, talk about. So basically the mean number of T cells, B cells, and NK cells all go down. And again, like there seems to be uh, a difference, uh, so more of a decline in patients who have severe disease than non-severe disease. Um, looking further uh, between all of these different cells, um, and, and here they're basically providing you with a normal range, and so in comparison with where these values normally lie, the B cells don't seem to be affected so much. Um, it seems to be more so the T cells, uh, which, are, uh, which are severely affected. So the T cell numbers are essentially um, going down. And there is a significant difference here, as you can see with the P value between those who have non-severe and those who have severe disease. Looking further at T cell subsets, so now we're looking at helper T cells and we're looking at the um, T suppressor cells, right? So the CD4 plus cells, the CD8 plus cells. Again, like, sorry, the headings are not here, but this is non-severe disease, and this is severe disease, and this is your p-value, right? So basically, you see that all of these numbers are going down, and again, more so in those who have severe disease, right? So you can see that p-value is significant. Looking further, and as I would mentioned to you, that, you know, there is a naive T-helper cell, and then there is further development of memory helper cells. And this is a really important thing in our control of infection, in our control of anything that our body consists, uh, you know, like considers foreign. So what happens with these, with these patients, and especially, again, those who have severe disease, uh, is that the naive helper T cell population is going up and the memory T helper cell population is going down. Um, and lastly, importantly, as I was mentioning, the T-Rex, which are really important in, our, in, 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 in maintaining immune homeostasis and controlling inflammation versus, versus um, you know, basically controlling inflammation, like you know, the balance between inflammatory, pro-inflammatory pro and anti-inflammatory you know, processes. So that's your T-Rex. And basically the activity, the number of the T-Rex here as you can see, like especially in patients who have severe disease, is going down. So what does this mean? It basically means, uh, based on all of this, if you think about it, like it, essentially this virus is leading to immune dysregulation and it's creating a pro-inflammatory state in your body, right? And this is what people have been seeing um, in, in all of these patients. As you run their labs, you see that their CRP levels are high, you see that their ferritin is high, and then, you know, in cases where um, specific interleukin uh, cytokine levels have been, have been uh, measured, like uh, folks are finding, like we're, we're finding that inflammatory cytokine levels are elevated. And um, even more so, again, like they tend to, they, they seem to correlate with disease and the levels are higher um, in, in, in those who have severe illness. Um, okay. Um, so I hope that makes sense so far. And again, I'll give you my email in the end. If anything does not make sense, I'm happy to discuss that further. Um, so we talked about like some of your labs, like other things you can start to see end organ dysfunction. So you might see kidney failure, very, very common to see kidney failure in these patients, hepatic failure. These are some of the other markers that you can see elevated, CPK. There are cases of um, uh, the COVID-19 uh, or SARS-CoV-2 induced cardiomyopathy. So you might actually see new heart failure develop in these patients, in which case like your CK or your troponin levels might be high. One that I'd like to talk about in particular, which has been receiving a lot of news is the D-dimer. Um, and a lot of um, basically management uh, changes have been made based on, based on this um, uh, pretty much across the board. So just a reminder of what the D-dimer is. So essentially you can see here, right, um, when uh, thrombin is activated, it acts upon fibrinogen um, and creates a fibrin monomer, right? Now this fibrin um, monomer like then basically is uh, stabilized by factor 13 and it becomes a fibrin polymer and essentially becomes an insoluble fibrin clot. 
So when this happens, uh, basically the fibrinolytic system in the body is activated and it, it breaks down this insoluble fibrin clot and creates smaller particles and that's basically what the D-dimer is. Okay, so we're finding that the D-dimer is elevated in these patients and especially those who have, who have severe disease and people are developing uh, thromboembolic uh, episodes that's felt to contribute to the lung injury is also uh, evidence is suggesting it's contributing to the uh, organ failure that folks develop like the kidney failure, et cetera. Um, this is um, preprint. So again, please remember this is not peer reviewed. Uh, so, you know, wait for the final decision on this paper, but these are autopsy findings. It's the first autopsy series from New Orleans. Um, and basically, I mean, the, 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 the images are here, um, but essentially what they found in these patients uh, when they looked at their lungs was diffused alveolar hemorrhage. They found uh, CD4 aggregates around thrombosed uh, small blood vessels and a lot of hemorrhage. Um, and the other, so, so, so basically they felt that essentially, initially it was felt that this is all a cytokine release syndrome. That's what's causing this, this picture that we see, the severe SARS that we see is all a cytokine release syndrome. As I just showed you that the cytokine levels are high, the inflammatory cytokines, and that's why people are getting so sick. But, but, but that has been challenged with, 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 with this uh, study and not just this, several other studies that have shown that um, there's actually a, uh, a coagulopathy that's associated with this infection. Um, and basically people are developing uh, thrombi uh, in a number of uh, different areas, including the lungs and the kidney, as I mentioned. Uh, so this has led to um, basically institution of protocols um, and it's been coming up in various guidelines as well uh, to um, give these patients, to start these patients on anticoagulation. And again, there's a lot of variation in what's being done between one institution uh, to the other, but I just want to tell you that strong consideration is being given uh, based on these findings to anticoagulate uh, these folks and uh, pretty much anybody getting admitted with uh, COVID, like, and, and, and most guidelines, most, um, uh, you know, like uh, treatment guidance that's out there, most protocols that I've looked at are giving very strong consideration. So even in someone who's not uh, considered very high risk, like, uh, you know, there's a strong, uh, fairly strong recommendation to start uh, prophylactic dose, um, uh, low molecular weight heparin. And then, of course, if someone is higher risk than that, based on their D-dimer levels, etc., uh, then there is uh, a recommendation to uh, strongly consider starting the patient on therapeutic anticoagulation using heparin or some of the other anticoagulants. Um, all right, and this is a long list of references, uh, basically behind the anticoagulation guidelines. The one uh, that I have a link for up on top is the uh, treatment guidance that's provided by the Mass General. It's free for the public. Um, take a look at that, and you know, so you can understand a little bit, a little bit better about how people are approaching this issue. And you know, you can certainly look at these uh, references. As I said, like there's more than one report of um, issues like these arising in these patients. Um, all right, so coming on to diagnosis, how do you make the diagnosis? Uh, basically, it's a real-time PCR. Uh, that's how you make a laboratory diagnosis. Um, you know, and, and, and the assays are basically uh, different, you know, between different parts of the world, between different institutions, et cetera. It's being offered by a number of different laboratories, by departments of health, et cetera, um, around the world. Uh, but basically, so, so, so certainly there's variation in the type of specimen, et cetera, the turnaround time, the uh, sensitivity, specificity. Um, and, and I want to say like that the sensitivity specificity for most of these assays is not entirely clear as of yet. And depending on which one you're using, uh, you're going to see different numbers and probably some words, see numbers that are not entirely true at this point in time because it just hasn't been enough time. Um, but basically, uh, it's real-time PCR, and um, you know what you need to do for most of these, like it's a nasopharyngeal swab. Um, I know in certain places there's a test which requires a nasopharyngeal as well as an oropharyngeal swab. So certainly, depending on the assay that you're using, there might be more than one. Um, but um, you know, for the most part, uh, as far as I know, for most parts of the world, it's a nasopharyngeal swab. Uh, and you then run a real-time PCR on that to diagnose the infection. 
Um, I cannot stress upon you um, more that we need to uh, use proper technique to obtain a nasopharyngeal swab. Um, and included here is a video from um, uh, the New England Journal of Medicine. Uh, I'm not going to run this video. Um, you guys can look at it later on. But basically, it shows you exactly, you know, how far, um, you know, how important it is, like, to have proper technique. Um, so take a look at this. This is very useful. Uh, the patient's head has to be bent like that at about 70 degrees, and you have to go into the posterior nasopharynx to collect the sample. Um, all right. Depending on what type of sample, as I said, assays differ from each other as well. But you know, based on what, uh, based on some data, and this is um, from uh, China. It was published in the JAMA. Basically, the, um, the percentage of positives um, in patients, so the yield of uh, lower respiratory tract testing, such as on bronchoalveolar lavage fluid, um, you know, seems to be higher um, than on the nasopharyngeal uh, swab. And I think I um, highlighted the wrong thing here, but basically this is your nasal swab. So, uh, you know, uh, essentially like 63% came back positive on nasal swabs, 72% came back positives on sputum, and 93% came back positive on bronchoalveolar lavage. So it highlights a number of different issues. You know, you know certainly the um, you know, uh, accuracy of your test can vary based on the specimen. Um, and you know, there certainly seems to be higher yield in specimens that are sent from the lower tract. Um, and, and why that is, I, I think it's probably for multiple reasons. Um, it, might, it, it, it may have something to do with the stage of the illness. We know that if you test somebody early on, the virus is actually present in very high levels in the upper tract. Um, you know, but most people are probably not being seen early on, like testing certainly has not been available such that people with mild symptoms or early disease are maybe not being tested as much as those who get really sick with it. Um, bottom line, you know, like just remember that the test is not perfect. Try to get your specimen accurately, try to collect it appropriately. And then if you continue to see negatives from, uh, you know, uh, nasopharyngeal or oropharyngeal swabs, Try to see if you can get a lower tract specimen. So if your patient's intubated, you can get uh, send a tracheal aspirate or send a bronchoalveolar lavage. Make sure that your lab uh, has the appropriate methodology, uh, validated methodology to run the test for you. Uh, but that might help improve your improve your yield. This is a typical chest X-ray from a patient with uh, with COVID. So as you can see, bilateral change, um, hazy, fluffy. Um, opacity is very suggestive of a viral pneumonia. So there's really nothing classic or characteristic like or, or, or new. Uh, you know, it just looks like a viral, viral pneumonia. Um, and this is a chest CT. So just an example of a chest CT from a patient with COVID, you can see ground glass change and again, uh, bilateral, bilateral change. Um, I won't talk too much about treatment and simply because uh, there's a lot of, um, there are a lot of things uh, making it out into uh, the literature, um, you know, which are of um, uh, questionable validity based on research methodology, et cetera. Um, so, you know, there really is no good evidence out there right now, uh, which tells us one way or the other as to what treatment to give patients and, and when to give it to them. This remains an area of active research. Um, the, the, there are links here, and you can look at the NIH guidelines, the IDSA, which is the Infectious Disease Society of America guidelines, and certainly take a look at clinicaltrials.gov to see all of the various agents, et cetera, that are being looked at uh, for this uh, infection. Uh, but it, there basically is no proven treatment right now. So what should your clinical approach be? Look for risk factors for severe disease. And I think we talked about some of these risk factors. Try to assess how sick the patient is. Is he mild, moderate, severe, critical? And then accordingly, can you manage this outpatient or do you need to bring a patient in? These are the risk factors, and I won't go into this in too much detail. You can look at it later, but depending on you know, how much data you have on the patient, starting with just things on their history, and then you know, their exam findings, their vital signs, and then if you have labs. Like, so all of these different things can help you categorize uh, how sick your patient is and how you need to manage them. So if, if, it's, if it's somebody who you feel has really mild disease, you know, and otherwise 
healthy person, not complaining of any shortness of breath, just complaining of some dry cough, fever, et cetera, that's the patient who can stay home and should stay home. Like, so ask them to do that, isolate from other family members, diligent, frequent hand washing. Like, and there are several videos out there like that tell you how to do this. Um, uh, CDC, you can look at cdc.gov, like, et cetera. Like, I mean, even a lot of videos through the NHS, which is the um, UK system, like tell you like exactly how we need to wash our hands and how most of us, all of us, like do a poor job, like of, of, of washing our hands. Um, and so you do that, like, you know, symptomatic care, if they have cough, et cetera, monitor, have them monitor their temperature and their respiratory symptoms, and then report back to the doctor in, in a few days. And then at the end of a seven day period, since the onset of symptoms, if the patient has been fever free without having to use medicine for 72 hours and have improvement of respiratory symptoms, then they can end that isolation. I will add something here though, like that it's preferable still to wear a face mask after that time period is over. In, in the public and in shared areas at home for an additional 14 days. And this is basically to cover the period of viral shedding that's been seen in most patients, um, which, which for most people is 21 days. Immune suppressed folks can, can, can shed for longer, certainly, but what we're seeing for most people based on the data so far is 21 days. So it covers that time period. And it helps to protect other people at your home, like, you know, like young children, like someone who's immune compromised, the elderly, as you know, who are all at uh, greater risk. Inpatient management, as I said, no proven therapies. So depending on what's available, where you're working, give strong consideration to enrolling people, your patients in clinical trials, okay? Mild disease usually categorized as O2Sats more than 93% and no pneumonia on chest imaging. Moderate disease is when your O2Sats are low or you have pneumonia on chest imaging, all right? So what do you do in these cases? The usual approach, and again, I'm, 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 I'm basing this like on like what I've seen in ins institutional guidelines, my own uh, institution and others, it's all the same essentially, uh, give or take a few things, but it's basically supportive care, right? Managing their respiratory failure, you know, is it nasal cannula, your non-rebreather, uh, intubation with ventilation, whatever's needed. Um, Anticoagulation, as I mentioned, is becoming a big part of what is being done for these patients. Uh, antibiotics, depending on the clinical picture, do you think there's a low bar pneumonia? Like, do you think there might be a secondary bacterial infection? Hydroxychloroquine, for which there really is no data, uh, it's something that's being studied. The question remains, but that's something you can consider. Please do monitor uh, the QTC for these patients, uh, you know, the QTC interval on your EKGs, because if somebody has an underlying, uh, you know, heart block like WPW, et cetera, there are cases of torsades in these patients. So please don't think this is benign. Um, remdesivir, like, which is an antiviral that's being looked at, again, like, you know, if it's available through a trial, uh, great, you can go for that. Steroids for lung injury, and again, between the critical care society and other societies, like, there's no consensus, like, but it can be considered in somebody who's ill. And I would recommend that you consult with your pulmonary and critical care uh, colleagues. Um, and that's how we tend to do it. Severe disease, again, with or without end organ disease, as I mentioned, that's usually uh, renal failure and hepatic failure, most commonly in these patients. Again, it's supportive care, anticoagulation, antibiotics if you need it, the five-day course of hydroxychloroquine, steroids. And then these are all the various types of things that are being looked at, remdesivir, convalescent plasma, so taking plasma from folks who've recovered and giving it to someone who's infected with severe disease. Mesenchymal stem cell therapy, anti-GM CSF, and this is an agent called um, gemcilumab, and then IL-6 receptor antagonists, of which the most famous one is tocilizumab, and that's what was widely used in China as well as in the Italian cohort. Uh, based on the initial understanding and, and you know, um, of, of, of this disease being a cytokine release syndrome. And as I said, like, you know, that might be true, uh, although there seems to be uh, other factors that are contributing, uh, the anti, uh, you know, the coagulopathy being one of them, et cetera, uh, still poorly understood, but IL-6 receptor antagonists can be considered in somebody with CRS. Pregnancy, uh, pregnant patients can get very sick with this. Um, there is compassionate use remdesivir, the antiviral, a 10-day course that can be applied for through Gilead. That's the pharmaceutical company uh, that can provide you, obviously monitor the baby, consult with your OB colleagues. Um, 
be safe, you know, in taking care of these patients and here, uh, based on what's available, uh, you know, and here it's hi highlighting, uh, this is from the CDC, like showing the use of N95 versus just a face mask, depending on what's available and either one. This is preferred, like with the N95, but the acceptable, or acceptable uh, alternative is here with a face shield and a regular uh, face mask, uh, gown and gloves, of course. Okay, so key points, our understanding of SARS-CoV-2 and COVID-19 is evolving. Uh, data on therapeutic options is emerging, and I, I would like to stress the bond stress that there are no proven therapies as of yet. So we really need to educate on uh, ourselves and um, you know our our, our families, our our, our um, patients, you know, uh, who are perhaps falling prey to a lot of false information. Uh, there's plenty of it on on the internet and other places. So um, you know, take a look at the data and. Um, try to make an objective assessment and try to educate others around you. Prevention is key. Um, we need to start talking about uh, triage systems uh, in our healthcare facilities, telehealth to help minimize contact of the public with the healthcare system. Folks who are not so sick should go home, should be managed as such. Uh, strict isolation precautions, use of the PPE, take a look at CDC WHO guidelines and uh, while we do not know a lot about this virus, we do know that social distancing works. Please shed shelter in place to stay safe and ask other people to do the same and diligent, diligent hand washing. Thank you for your attention and there's my email if you have any questions. Thank you.